Hey guys, and welcome to the Garage Athlete Show. We are on episode 43, myself and Daniel Fraser, and we should be joined by one Ben Wharton very, very soon. Ben is an IPF powerlifter. Um, I think Dan and him lift in the same it fed i think it's called fed yeah so he's in the ipf which um in short means tested um no yeah. wraps they typically well we're meant to have the stricter standards um but you know open to uh interpretation but yeah they know they typically make the guys and girls bench um pause their bench a little bit longer squat a tiny bit deeper and you have to wear um sleeves if you're competing without equipment so that's no wraps but um you know moving that aside yeah it's, it's a very popular fed in the uk i think it's the gbbf great british powerlifting i don't know how to shorten it um association in the uk if you want to lift in there and it's probably your best route to go if you're starting out to get used to the commands lifting um learning about powerlifting and then once you've maybe you could try there there's other federations around where you can use wraps so, and there's um tested untested and there's you know loads of different um things you can go and lift in but that's typically the big one when you see guys like the ray williams squats and uh, the Blaine Sumner lifting, doing these like, you know, insane uh, mm -hmm. lifts. They're normally in the IPF, which when you see right. the sort of bendy, crazy um, deadlifts, they're normally in different federations, which um, have different rules and um, different, um, what do you call it, testing procedures. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say about like different feds uh, within the UK, because obviously, um, you guys know I'm a natural bodybuilder and when I started there was two natural bodybuilding federations there was the BNBF and the UK DFBA now there's about six so about four have come into the UK in the last year or so mm -hmm. I think it's because UK DFBA moved away from the WNBF which is the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation so now they've come in and they're bringing in their own show uh, two bros, which is the um, the untested guys that promote the the pro league for the what, proper bodybuilders. What is that? I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> um, they they've brought out like a natural series, and then there's the PCA is not PCA. There's another one as well. So yeah, it's gone from right. You've got two shows to pick from to now there's like six federations. So there's now from about May time right through to December, there's natural shows all throughout. So me messing up my dates with when my holiday is gonna be isn't as much of a problem now, because if I need to push everything back, I can. Mm -hmm. There's a show that's like slightly earlier. So I might be jumping on stage at the end of July now, rather than mid to late August. So that's what, four weeks earlier than I was planning. But I'm also not panicking if I'm not in the right place because it just means, right, I can just go to one of these different. And that's one of the, I think that's one of the benefits about being an amateur athlete is that you, you're not tied to a particular federation. You're not tied to a particular organization. Mm -hmm. um, you can go and compete at these different things and there's not like sponsorships to worry about. There's not all this, the background politics of it all. Mm -hmm. And how's prep going? Good, all right. Dropped under 80 kilos now for the first time. So I spent, I think I, it was like 79.9, then 79.7, and then I did a leg day, so jumped back up to over 80 again. But yeah, feeling a bit better. I've had to tighten things up a little bit. Like my calories are dropping down now, so I'm on like 2,800 on a training day, 2,600 on a non-training day, doing like 15,000 steps a day, and two bouts of cardio. So still plenty of tools to use, but it's I'm I'm starting to feel it a little bit now. I'm starting to feel a bit hungry, like at certain points throughout the day. My body's going to me, right? You need to eat. It's normally when my next meal's due, or if I've I've missed my meal by like half an hour, and now getting those um biological signals, my body's going, right, you need to eat. Whereas before, when I was on like 4,000 calories, if I missed the meal. I wouldn't notice until the next meal and I go, oh crap, I've now got to eat two meals in the same thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think we, we've started in a really, really good place. I'm about 15, 16 weeks out now. So we'll see um, if I go for that one or I end up 
holding off and going for the one in the middle of September. Uh, as I said, I'm not I'm not stressing about it as much um, anymore. I'm trying not to get too hung up on like a particular show. Like I want to come in like absolutely peeled this time. Whereas I think last time my first show was the last show of the season. So I like, I had to be ready for that, but I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. So I didn't turn up looking my best whereas when i went to the next one which was an untested fed so there was no way that i, I was going up against guys that were on juice and diuretics like i in my head i knew i wasn't going there to win i was going there to get more stage time and to practice my posing and i came away from that feeling great even though i didn't like it's the, the i'll have to get my rhino's participation trophy out at some point it's the only one i've kept like the other one's in a drawer somewhere, like I don't care. But that one, it's a really, really cool medal. I was like, okay, I, I don't normally believe in participation trophies, but I'm going to keep this one because it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. That sounds, that sounds all good. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I competed. It was, oh yeah, it was November 2019. So it's been nice. quite a while. Wow, that was that is wild, isn't it? Yeah, it was a shit day. Um, no, I remember not, you said you messed. Was that the one where you messed up your water load? I just messed up my weight cut. I got yeah, a bit it. too confident in my ability to drop weight, and right. I ended up having to lose two kilos in two days. Wow! Which normally isn't the biggest deal, but it really it played havoc. Sport, it can have a big effect, though. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, I left about. Oh God, I think. Well, the squat I thought I had on the day was 20 kilos less. The bench I thought on the other day was about 10 kilos, well, probably seven and a half kilos less. And then the deadlift was about 20 kilos less. So I wow. left around 40 to 50 kilos off my total, which in powerlifting terms is huge. Mm. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't good. But, um, you know, weight class is a bit of a double-edged sword. They're nice to lift in uh, in terms of if you want to win, um, you know, you normally want to try and, I guess ideally lift in the the lightest weight class you can be, but be the strongest. But at the same time, you know, there's a common bit of knowledge going around. Like basically, unless you're in the contention for gold medals or you know national titles, you're probably better off not worrying about a weight cut and just lifting because it, there's a lot of stuff going on the day. And with weight cuts, it ends up being more. You, you actually end up putting more effort and time and energy and stress into cutting weight than actually lifting. Yeah. which I don't think is a healthy thing. I mean, it's it's not it's not ideal to do that. I mean, if you're doing, you know, like 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 I just said earlier, trying to go for world records and championships and titles and all that. Yeah, okay, it's part. It is part of the process, and it's something you need to learn how to do and do well. But then again, I've always said, um, what do you call it? Weight classes are high classes in disguise. So you'll typically find the guys that excel in their weight class, especially on same day weigh-ins, are kind of the most built in that, um, what do you call it, weight class anyway. So you'll find, you know, you want to fire a bit shorter, a bit sort of thicker. You know, I'm six foot three and I, I lift at 120, whereas probably I should be in an, in an, in an open class because of the frame I have. I think I could be around 130 kilos to be mm. a bit more competitive. But of course, there comes the aesthetic side and, you know, all that comes into play as well. But you'll typically find the smaller guys, they almost fill out their weight class. So they look yeah. absolutely jet like I don't know. I think it's Russell. He's Russell on Instagram. I don't know his second name. I'll, I'll Google it. Just absolutely jacked to, to a fuck. And he fills out the 83s just like a monster. But, you know, it looks like a bodybuilder. You know, he's a yeah. Fucking, maximum but, um, amount of muscle minimum amount of body fat so that, yeah, yeah i mean body fat can help leverages it, it can and it will help leverages to a certain extent but at the same time muscle is what's going to do the movement right you need yeah. to have muscle to move the weight so if you can i mean that's why this has been this big push on body comp because if you can be as jacked as possible you've potentially got more muscle you've got more muscle to train you can be a bigger muscle has the potential to be a stronger muscle yeah yeah so i mean talking of do you think it's gone a bit too far that way, though? As in, people are now sacrificing, like, if they weren't concentrating so much on the weight cut and were just concentrating on just getting as strong as possible, like, do you think it could be taking away from some people's performance by oh, chasing? Oh, okay. yeah, tons. And, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this with um, Ben when he comes on, but tons and tons, because I think he's just gone up a weight class as well, but tons and tons and tons of lifters 
are really shooting themselves in the foot to get like I wouldn't say it's a paper trophy, but to win like the local meet at like 83 kilos when it's like, well, realistically, no, no one gives a shit. And this is a mistake I made as well. Um, and I was 105 for quite a while, whereas I should have surely just been patient and gone up to 120. Um, yeah, they're definitely limiting their progress. I had a big chat with myself and I was like, I, I want to be more about the most amount of weight I've ever lifted, not what weight I've lifted at what body weight. I want to look, but no, you know, you don't really look back and go, well, I did this at this body. It was like, well, all right, well, if you're like five, 10 kilo heavy, would you have lifted like 20K more? Surely that's the better PB. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I've always said it takes years and years and years and years and years and years to get really strong and patience and time. Whereas I think to get, you know, we're not talking stage lean, but we're talking, you know, between 10 and 15% body fat. You can do that in a year if you're relatively lean. Yeah. So, you know, I would always push people into, unless they're, you know, unless they're very overweight, I would say push more into getting as strong as possible um, because you can always cut down or cutting down and building back up. But yeah, I think, I think some people are limiting themselves on weight classes. I also think on the other end of the spectrum, some heavier guys and girls could really benefit from dropping a weight class for a bit learn yeah. how to get leaner and then build themselves back up yeah so, uh, i yeah. think well i've massively brought into like my transformation coaching like that initial recomp to sensitize up like there's loads and loads of science about it however you develop better habits when you're dieting like you're just more dialed in just because the results you can see are much much faster so if you want to sort out some of these habits, like stick them in a diet, uh, stick them in a dieting phase because they have to be tracking their steps. They have to be looking at the food. They have to be looking at the water intake. And because you've got that set goal in mind, it's very, very easy to get all those habits in place. Then when you transition into a building phase, they've already got those habits established. All you do now is you just add in more food, but they've still got then the good habits of, walking of track of still tracking their food even though there's more food of getting plenty of fluids in of looking after their health so that actually when they go into a building phase they're actually having a productive building phase they're not just getting fat and i think that's the most common mistake like guys make when they're trying to build is they just eat everything they're not in a like controlled surplus it's just right i'm going to eat and I'm going to eat and I'm going to keep eating just to get big. And they almost put on too much body fat too quickly. And then they look at the mirror and go, oh, crap, I just got fat. Um, so, yeah, it's, de it's definitely I completely agree about like sometimes taking a step back in terms of weight to then push on forward in terms of performance. Um, that's I think a lot of people could benefit from that. But it's interesting what you say about people shooting themselves in the foot and like chasing aesthetics because you see it again a lot in bodybuilding like they guys especially amateur guys they they want to be like instagram lean like all year round and you, you can't grow after your first few years like you can't grow being like six to ten percent body fat like people say like lean bulking and all that that's just not getting enough calories in um you, you can't stay like shredded all year and add a decent amount of muscle tissue on if you're doing it naturally. Like the whole assisted side of stuff, again, yes and no. Like if you look at all the top bodybuilders, like they still have off seasons where they get a little bit fluffy, where their diet, when they're dieting down and cutting for a show, they're still cutting 20, 30 pounds of muscle, not muscle, 20, 30 pounds of fat. Like they've got a decent amount of weight to lose because they've they've spent that time kind of in a surplus. Mm. Cool, man. Right. Uh, let's try and get Ben in the chat. Let's see what we uh, just send the message out to him now. So no worries. <laughs> How's the twins? They seem to have cooperated tonight. Uh, yeah, they got to sleep a bit earlier, which is quite nice actually. Um, I've got the room link address. Yeah, they think it's not too bad. Oh, fuck's sake. Give me two. Send it again on Messenger. Uh, what I'll do is I will invite him over here. Copy event invite link. There you go. This should work nicely. Yeah, they're, they're good, man. Just um, it's handy having a clover back at school. Yeah. Uh, what, for Monday? Or is she already back? Yeah, she was. She went back on Tuesday, and that's okay. Great. 
Easter holidays like are all kinds of messed up in different parts of the country. My kids, yeah, are still like off. Catholic, like faith schools have different times off, and private yeah. schools are longer, and like um, some some are earlier. So I think they all have Easter off, but they really, um, really well, do up. my kids broke up on the Thursday before Easter Sunday. So normally the Easter holidays, the Easter weekend falls right in the middle. But yeah, literally they broke up on the Thursday, so they've had like two and a half weeks off. Um, but the older ones are old enough to pretty much look after themselves now. I still have to feed Josh, but that's about it. <laughs> right, so I think he's seen the message now, so he should be popping in. Coming in. Fingers crossed. We don't get this technical glitch. We need, one, we need some like standby music. Oh, this is where we could put the sponsors in, mate. We need to go get yeah. some sponsors. Get some. So yeah, anybody who's listening that wants to sponsor the podcast, drop us a message. Let's have a chat. Absolutely. I think we should get Lidl's Perlin Backer Pilsner on. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That should be the sponsor for the thingy. Oh, I think he's in. Should be in. Ben's phone. We've got a phone. He's coming in, lads. He's coming in. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, can you put your screen on? Doing it now. Give it a sec. Here he is. Hey, good? How you doing, mate? <laughs> How's it going, guys? Yeah, good. Thanks for coming on, mate. This is uh, my co-host, Don, Deej PT. This is uh, yeah. Ben. Nice to meet you, Ben. Nice to meet you, mate. I gave you a follow like a week and a half ago. I only just oh, got nice. one back now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like that, mate. He's ruthless. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's bad, mate. How, are getting, how are you getting on, Ben? How's things? I'm good, mate. I'm absolutely destroyed right now, but I'm going to do my best with this. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about why you're destroyed. Pretty much. Did you just double, was it 325? It was indeed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which was 325. Um, like over my best on like fully calibrated comp kit, comp collars, Alico bar, everything. Like that's like 12 and a half over my best. Um, yeah. 10 what up on last well, and then. Um, five on my best ever which is like without on a rogue and like without collars and stuff and like those little things really make a difference yeah, uh, what so, oh. <laughs> this is where me and you will geek out like hell but for <laughs> for the other sort of garage lifters uh, and don's benefit when he's listening what do you mean by comp kit alico collars uh the spec all that kind of stuff um, oh mate honestly um <laughs> so the alico bar isn't even mine i want to like preface with that because it's like that bar is like a grand and a half and it's like that is just excessive and it like alico as a thing like as a company like are excessive with how much they cost for stuff but like it, like honestly training on that recently has been huge it's one of my friends and like he he's been powerful for like three or four months he just bought it and i was literally like Mate, what are you doing? I was like, I don't even have one of those. But he's, so basically the plan is because of Corona, obviously I haven't maxed out in like a year and a half. So I'm planning, even though comps are now starting to come back, um, I'm planning to do a mock meet with like all of my training partners um, at like, like the 30th of May. So I'm literally like purely training at home. And like, I've got a lot of friends training with me that are also doing the same, like the same mock meet that we're doing, uh, which is gonna be really good fun. And it just means that I've been able to train on that, on that bar consistent, consistently, which has been, fucking awesome um like i didn't know the difference was as large as it was i was like oh power bars a power bar it is whatever but genuinely like i felt a real different a difference that alico is like literally brand new and it just feels so much stiffer to me even than, than my rogue which is a year, only a year old mm. um and then that combined with the comp collars um it, my friend Eric Marta got me onto it a while ago and he was like, nah, the comp colors really make a difference. And I was like, kind of like, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm lifting on comp plates, it's calibrated. It's still the same weight. Like it's it's not a thing, but the comp collars actually prevent the weight from rotating. Like, so that it can't like literally spin as you're lifting it. Um, and like for me, because I'm quite a fast lifter, I feel like I get an advantage out of that. Like it really makes a difference. It feels a lot more solid on my back or in my hands when I'm squatting. And, and deadlifting, to be fair, is the one that I know is the, the smallest difference. But it, I think it makes it harder for me to grip the bar because like like my grip is one of my biggest issues. Um, I mean, even on that 325, like that was RP10 on grip. I could barely hold on to it. Um, and like for, for deadlift, then it's it, it's training how I'm going to compete. And I mean, honestly, like power thing is this thing of specificity. And like once you get to the highest, like I'm not I'm not this crazy high level, but like once you get to that higher level, it becomes a lot more about doing things as close as you possibly can. So yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I love it. I mean, 
Yeah, we're basically have powerlifters, especially particular IPF lifters. I think we've got a bit of a um, rep of being really anal about things and over the top. Oh. And I, I get that. I think, I think where I draw the difference is maybe say someone like yourself, who is, you know, I think you're, you're British champion, right? At um, under twenty, the British champion, third in Europe. For you, we're talking about tiny little things that are going to make the difference between you winning or losing a comp, right? You know, we could be talking two and a half kilos. So for you, right at that sort of top kind of level, these little things like comp colors, comp plates, spec, uh, you know, wearing a singlet uh, for training, you know, this kind of stuff, making sure, you know, everything is to the right spec, training out of a combi rack is important. You know, we're talking about these 1% that add up. I would say for most people, I don't think it's that important. I mean, we still got, you know, like Tony Cliff and et cetera, he lifts at home and, you know, body power, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it, it, I find if it can help you mentally as well on the day, knowing I know exactly how this is going to feel and you yeah, think exactly. you're an advantage. Oh, hey, a lot of feel, you know, like a lot, like a lot of it is, you know, if I, if I do a squat, I know what that weight feels like with that exact setup. And it's being, having your technique used to that setup, like, you know, knowing what that amount of, bar whip and whatever does to your technique and how that's going to hold up because a lot of the time you see someone miss a lift and it's because of the technical breakdown at the end of the day like you know if you miss a squat your torso gave out you know you lost your you lost your position um you know if you lose a deadlift it's a lot of the times you know you get into this position where the lockout goes because you're too hunched over you're too rounded you've you've been pulled forward off the floor so being able to feel what that truly feels like especially when the powerlifting is becoming very much like you know, like I say, specificity. So people are handling heavier weights all year round. So being able to handle a heavy weight, that is exactly how it will be on comp day is quite useful. Um, I mean, I'd use the example of, I, I mean, I didn't used to have all this kit. Like I've, I've had like a home gym since, since I started, I started at home. Um, and literally um, I remember my first powerlifting comp and like my second, power, my second powerlifting comp was the main one where in training, I doubled 250 on squat and I was going, and it was to depth. It was everything. It was, you know, the, it was, you know, competition standards in terms of like the lift itself. Um, but I went in and then my third attempt, absolute grind, it was 250. And I took a step back and was like, why did that happen? Was I just not as strong on the day? Like, what was it? And then I weighed all of my plates and obviously I had 25s on, but I had a total of five plates on because I had four 25s and a 15 per side. Uh, and they were all half a kilo out, which was five kilos out. And you think that doesn't make a difference. But when, you, when you're doing attempt selection, five kilos, you think you're five kilos stronger than you actually are, which really matters, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good point. You know, there's a big argument, weight is weight. Um, but I guess sometimes it's not. <laughs> I mean, particularly, I think... Where it really starts to make a difference is with the the higher weights, I think, you know, potentially lifting, you know, like you said, you think you're lifting 250 and then suddenly you're lifting all of a sudden 255, 257. Yeah, that's that's a bit of a jump, especially on bench as well. That catches quite a lot of people out. They think the bench is probably the one lift I see on comp day most people, you know, myself included, really struggle with because of the, you know, the, the length that they, they make you hold it for. You know, we said we were talking about oh, this. Don't the even get podcast. started. The IPF pause, you know, all that kind of stuff. I always think the benches in comp feel like shit compared to the pads you get at home. Um, it does, it does make a difference, and this is why people. It seems a bit crazy sometimes, you know. But it's, bear with me here. But it does. It, it is these one percent. It is these little things that add up to to get to that top level. And I think you know when you're lifting, you know, what three two five for a double. What's your bench like? One eight five is it? Uh, on bench, yeah, one uh, one nine five. I've done. The one nine five, and I think is it, is it a two ninety squat, or have you done more since? A two, I've done. Yeah, so we're talking. You know, these are some seriously fucking big lifts. And then, are you, what you are you still a, a junior? Uh, no, I've, I aged out last year. Um, so well, uh, you know, aged out last year. over now. <laughs> I didn't even know you could power lift at 23. So it's it's pretty, yeah, it's incredible, man. So you're already, although you're still this young age, you've already accomplished these huge lifts. So yeah, you need to get all the tiny little... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we, won't, we won't play it down. It's big, mate. So it's kind of like, yeah, I can see why, you know, these you need these everything to be flying exactly right. Because, you know, there'll be, let's talk about when you go to a comp. You know, it's super high anxiety, arousals off the scale. You know, you can, you know, things can be one on lost on one call, uh, one light. So if you are going into these comps, having, you know, knowing that everything you've done is to comp standard on comp equipment, that's a big, whew, I've ticked that box. You know, you can get ready for that lift. For that and like, you know, 
like I say, there's so many little things. Like you mentioned the benches and how, you know, bench, that tends to be the thing. So obviously, like when you train close to a comp, you start training with commands, you start getting like a, a good press command. And like the IPF is particularly brutal with their with their command, which I hate. I think that's stupid. I think it's really annoying um, because it's like in, the, in their rule book, it's when it's stable on the chest, that's when you get a press command. And like you see some of the commands and it's like, it was stable like a second ago and then I get it a second later and it's like, uh, I don't know. But then as well, you know, the bench itself, like if you have like a soft bench, like you see people like Sean Narega training on like, if you know who that is, training, training on like fat pads um, out, out on their like, you know, when they're far out from comp and then, you know, they transfer over to like an Alico or like a harder bench, like an ER rack or something. And just that makes a big difference for them because um, like when you, when it's a soft bench, you can really dig into it more. And because of that, your arch then is way better. And like, obviously Sean Narega is like one of the most technically spot on lifters in the world on bench. Um, and he yeah, loses like, he loses like 10 kg on bench. He has a massive arch. And he loses 10 kg going from a fat pad to a, a an ER rack. So it's a, it's a real thing. It's, it's crazy. I mean, what do you think about lifters wearing these grip shirts and training them? Uh, I, I, like, I think that's okay because I think most people do then train without chalk. I feel like the chalk balances it out. Like, yeah. you know, if you uh, like for me, I, I I I don't train with a grip shirt normally. I do have them, um, but I don't notice a big difference between that and just having my back chalked. That said, you know, if you are in a singlet, obviously, you know, maybe it's a little bit slippier. Um, but yeah, it's not too bad in my opinion. I don't think it makes a massive difference. I mean, I hate it on spot. I, 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 tr I try and get on the bar quite aggressively and I find that like it almost digs in and prevents me from properly wedging under in the right way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you. I mean, I've, I've recently, well, I got one off the, uh, it's in here somewhere, like an A7 one, I got one and I've used it on bench and I was like, fuck, this feels brilliant. But like you say, it feels like someone's chalking you back. But when you're training alone in a garage, that's, that's brilliant that you can do that. But um. I mean, you know, you, you, the, the, I like it well, you speak about um, like benches and obviously what I would say regarding a seven and like, you know, their strategy with like the, the bar grip stuff is most commercial gyms and most like, you know, I'm talking about lifting on like a comp rack, which mm. in itself is a really good setup. Um, a lot of the times these people are going from, you know, gyms where the facilities for bench are worse. Like I, I, you guys are both coaches, I think, and I'm a coach myself and trying to, trying to help someone get better at bench when it's like the facilities are really limiting, like how good your technique is. Um, so you know, a seven using a shirt that completely makes sense because it's kind of a case of, well, you know, I'm trying to get everything that I can out of this poor equipment. Whereas on the day I will have better equipment, even though I won't have the shirt. So it's almost like a bounce out, you know? Oh, absolutely. I think I think everyone would benefit from it. I think even bodybuilders for pressing and dumbbell pressing, like it's it's a huge thing that scap for stability. Like you, when you mentioned about the fat pad, I recently got a. I, I was quite lucky and got hold of one of the fourteen inch fat pads from Extreme before they discontinued it. I went from that pressed on a twelve inch bench, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Like it was, oh, it was insane <laughs> the difference. You, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a good. That's it. There you go. There's a top tip for everyone: get yourself a hold of a grip shirt, uh, improve your pressing. Yeah. I mean, I've had some of my clients do it because they can't always chalk their back in a gym yeah. every time, especially because it makes the gym owners hate them, you know, <laughs> and like, but we have enough issues as powerlifters with, oh, with gym man. owners stuff and, you know, it's just like the, the powerlifters come in the gym, everyone's like, oh, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they always well, walk just, in with a kit bag full of accessories as well. And they're like, oh God, this guy's going to be here for three hours. <laughs> I'll just have this three rack hours. like two to three hours because I've got to do squat and then I've got to do bench. <laughs> yeah, man. I've, I've had to split out my squat and bench because I was like, you know, I've got um, the twins, uh, newborns, and I'm like, I cannot be here for two hours. It's just insane the amount of taste. But the funny thing is, is like, my wife constantly rips me. She's like, so you've done, have you done three sets of five or five sets of three today, Dan? I was like, Oh shit! Well, I did five threes, and yeah, it took nearly an hour and a half to do that on squats. Now I'm moving <laughs> on to bed. I'm so fucking. It's hard, man. Like the, <laughs> yeah. most of it's rest as well. So like yeah, most totally. about four hours, but my actual amount of workload in that time is annoyingly low. <laughs> but oh, it's absolutely. like normal. Like today, for example, like I, I spent an hour warming up for deadlifts because like you, I want to, I've, I've not got, when it's that heavy weight, I'm taking big jumps. So there isn't that many sets, but you want to get every warm set right. But like I come into that session, like this is the biggest deadlift I've ever done, but I, I have to, if I want to set this up, I have to do it right, you know? And so yeah. you just end up taking ages. <laughs> so, out of all the weightlifting sports like why did you choose powerlifting over something like bodybuilding or olympic weightlifting so so for me so i'll give you like my backstory of like how i kind of got into this because it's like it is still a really niche sport in itself hmm. um 
So I got into powerlifting because um, in school, I was naturally really like quite a big lad. Um, and, and like I, you know, we do, you do all of the different kind of sports. And, you know, I, I did a fair bit of rugby, really enjoyed that. Very like adrenaline focused, very fun. Um, but the thing that really like I realized I was really good at was was shot put. So, you know, you just sort of do it in a lesson and whatever. Um, and I did it and thought nothing of it. And then it was like, oh, you're actually the best in the year. And I was like, oh, cool. So then I did it on like that sports day. And then, you know, from there, then it was like, all right, well, now you're going to compete for the school and you're going to compete against these other guys. And then I, I went and won a couple. There was like a couple of like school comps that we went to. And then I finished up with a district record in shot in like year nine or something. And I broke right. the school record like three years running and was kind of like, OK, I'm, I'm actually quite good at this. And I've never found something that in sport that I was good, to, good at. I was, you know, kind of like, a couch potato really I didn't really do a whole lot outside of just lessons and stuff themselves of doing PE um but my family kind of like gave me a nudge I wouldn't say my parents like a super like pushy but they were kind of like you know like you should like actually we'll take you down to athletics track and you should do it like there's a there's a coach there um you know he, he, he'll 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 give you some pointers and sort you out and then you can do them better so I was kind of like oh right yeah okay so then I I, I did that for like around I want to say four years um and I, I ended up doing a couple of, I went to nationals a few times, never did that well at nationals, to be fair. Like, I think I came like last and second last and stuff, but um, I broke another district record and I competed for like the North of England and uh, won at ca a county level a few times and stuff. So like, I was decent at shot I've, and I really, really enjoyed it genuinely like it. And it definitely got me into that thing. But then I would go to nationals and I, I'm, I'm six foot. And at the time I was like around... 102 103 or something and i was against guys that were legitimately like 18 19 stone and were like six four six five and i was kind of like yeah this is this is really rough like there's nothing i can do about this um so then i was kind of like well you know i'm actually stronger than a lot of these guys i'm like i'm physically better they just have this leverage of you know with the shot you get that extra reach and like that is a huge thing in itself um but yeah, I was always quite athletic and I was kind of like looking for what I should do when I decided I just couldn't do shot anymore because it was just frustrating for me. Um, and then, yeah, so I just started looking around and uh, watched a lot of YouTube videos and was kind of like, and I found Johnny Candido one day and was looking at that and was kind of like, this is quite a cool sport. Like this is very strength based, which in shot was what I cared about anyway. It was I cared about sort of like shot was quite like a strength focused thing that I thought. And I was kind of like, you know, I'm one of the stronger guys. Um, and I looked at like the Yorkshire records and was kind of like, oh, um so the record for my like age and weight is only like 220 like I could potentially do that and like the open record at the time was like 235 and like, I preach now like don't worry about records don't look at that shit it doesn't matter but at the time like that was quite motivating was, like oh I'm gonna go there I'm gonna do this um so I rocked up to my first comp and like I thought I was gonna be like this unreal like oh, I'm gonna be oh, straight off the bat I'm just gonna be so good and I I rocked up and I immediately got destroyed by um I came fourth and I thought I was gonna come first and break these New Yorkshire records and whatever but I, I came fourth to a guy called Kieran Gray uh, I don't know if either of you know who he is but like, and, so, like <laughs> at the time obviously we were both 93s he told 647 and I think I told like 585 which isn't bad for like a first comp uh, at 93 and like literally 19 listeners just uh what, what did you squat bench instead of oh i did um so i squatted 225 which did get me the ultra junior record which was what, what part of what i was after but i missed it on my second because i just freaked out and it came back and like it was easy on the third but it's one of those one of those things where it's like you know pre-comp nerves isn't it you just you just brick it and you just can't do it i benched i think i benched two 125 or something um, I, I, I think I missed 130 on my head coming up or something. I just didn't know that was a rule. Um, and then deadlift, I pulled 240. And then uh, for some reason, I just thought it was going to tell 260 and failed that badly. <laughs> so I think that adds up to like either 575 or 585. I find it hard to remember, but around, around that. Uh, but yeah, and you know, obviously like I was like 60 kg off of Kieran um, and was kind of like, oh, so... I'm not very good after all. And I, I just remember that car ride home, like so vividly of like, I guess I just quit now. Like I was just kind of like, what, what now? Like uh, this sport that I thought I was going to be really good at. And I've just spent like six months training for, like hasn't gone very well. And I had to sort of pick myself up and just be like, right. Okay. Um, you know, like, you know, shot, I've had enough bad comps. Like I'm not a quitter. Like we'll keep doing this and we'll come back. And like this guy, Kieran, like I want to beat him. That's my goal. Like, um, and then, you know, so I went to that Nationals and actually Kieran bombed because he cut about 10 kilos. <laughs> so he bombed. So in the end, I came fourth at my first juniors, which was 
a really good result, but I was very disappointed because I felt like I still underperformed. My squat and my bench were perfect. I went from 225 to 250. Um, bench, I went from 125 to 140, uh, still as a 93. And then deadlift, I opened with 230. And I jumped to 255 and missed it twice. So the deadlift curse sort of continued. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, fourth was like a good place to start, but I felt like I was capable of second and whatever. So then, you know, I, I, I then, Kieran moved up a weight class and I forced myself to stay down, which I heavily, heavily regretted uh, in the long term. But I, I did a, a comp six months later or eight months later and like didn't really total a whole lot more. I think I did... Uh, like around 620, I think at night, at 90 and 93. So I maybe added like, oh no, I think I did like 647. Yeah, but I did 620 prior. So I, I only added like 27 kilos and still missed a lot of lifts and still made a lot of mistakes. But, and then I went up weight class from there and got stronger and stronger. And it just, the rest is history. It just kind of went from there. And I've just sort of never looked back. The, the, the sad thing is I've never beaten Kieran. <laughs> uh, Kieran is actually like eased off now, but he, he ended up becoming third at Worlds. Like he became an unbelievable lifter that I was always sort of chasing. And only now he's sort of like, you know, he's he's not even really training at the moment, but I'm getting close to his best ever numbers. So maybe I'll beat those. <laughs> but yeah. it's kind of like... I'm a little rivalry going on there. Term. Does he know about this rivalry or is this just in your oh, head? Oh, it's in my head, man. Like, <laughs> what, he knew that I, I... It's not even a rivalry. Like I always really looked up to him like an incredible lifter. Yeah. Um, and you know he told eight sixty five at one twenty, which is insane. Uh, and like I said, I still, I'm moving up now. I'm about one eleven now because I said I would never hold myself back. So I'm I'm progressing and trying to just get heavier and bigger and stronger. And uh, you know I'm probably around the eight fifty marks. I'm getting close, but but yeah, it was never an actual. We we only competed against him that one time. Every other time it was like he was always a weight class above me or or, or a certain amount of weight ahead of me. So, but yeah, I, I literally remember in my home gym writing like what is Kieran Gray doing and just sticking it on my wall and just like I just look at that and be like I gotta get better man you might want to work on that yeah I was gonna <laughs> say it's um it's good to have because as, as you said like by the sounds of it you guys are like amicable together it's not like all right I have to be this guy's like the enemy it's just right here's somebody who's better than me and I think it's interesting how Basically, unless you're number one in the world at something, there's always going to be somebody who's better than you. And yeah. just having that hunger and that drive to try and catch them helps to kind of keep your head in the game a little bit. I think a lot of people like, there's a whole thing of like, trying not to be like too competitive and don't be a sore loser. And it's like the taking part that counts and all that kind of bullshit, basically. But <laughs> like... At the end of the day, people only really wi only remember the winners. People only remember who comes in first, second, and third. Like those are the people that get the titles. Those are the ones that have the legacy. And I think a lot of people are afraid to compete in case they lose. But actually, losing isn't the worst thing you can do. Like sometimes losing to somebody who's genuinely better than you then gives you that thing of okay, I need to go away and get better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, that's what I love about these kind of sports. Like, you know, obviously you're like more of a bodybuilding coach, but you'll understand where I'm coming from in that, you know, bodybuilding, power of things, sort of strong man, like these kind of sports, like they're very individual. Like, yeah, it's you're against other people, but at the end of the day, like, like let's say, you know, you go to a bodybuilding show and you look the best you've ever looked in your entire life and you're, and you can see the visible improvements from last time around and you've gotten better, but you still come last. It's like, and it's the same with power thing, you know? Oh, right, you know, I, I hit, I went nine for nine. I hit PBs on every lift and like performed the best I've ever done, but I didn't win. It's like, okay, so did you lose? And the answer is no, because it, you know, at the end of the day, you like the whole point of the sport is you've gotten better. And that's yeah. one of the problems with the sport now as well in, in these kind of sports is they're growing in sports and everyone's going, oh, I want to compete for GB or I want to be competitive. And it's like, well, with the size of the sport now, not everyone can be competitive. It can't yeah. be about being competitive. At the end of the day, just improve. Like if, you, if you're getting better, be happy with that. Like there's yeah. nothing more that you can do. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like with me against Kieran, like I, genuinely, I'd say Kieran is, or always has been like genetically better than me. Like he's just really gifted as a lifter and I'm not as gifted. And I've worked really hard to try and keep up with him, but I still have never done it, you know? And it's one, yeah. of, it's one of those things like, well, you know, I, I'm doing everything that I can. You know, it's the same with all the other guys in the UK. I mean, obviously, Kieran doesn't really do it as, as strictly as he used to. But there's some guys out there that I'm looking at and I'm like, you're just 
genetically better than me. Like I, I'm doing everything I can. If anything, you're getting further away from me. You're, you, 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 you're getting away and there's nothing I can do about that. I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm, 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 my nutrition is spot on. Like I'm getting enough sleep, like, you know, my hydration, like, you know, I'm, I'm supplementing and whatever. And, you know, I'm doing everything I can. And it's like, you know, you do everything you can. You just have to be happy with that. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very, very interesting point that you've made there that it, it is kind of, a, it's not the taking part, but it's the journey and it's the understanding that like it, in an individual sport, it's you versus yourself. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like, like it is, it's that you versus you. And like, uh, you know, as long as you're improving, like humans, as humans, we're like, like addicted to these sort of like small accruing gains of like, you know, it's this, it's this thing that just keeps us hooked. And that's part of the joy of powerlifting is like, it's so like that. And like, same with bodybuilding is like over the long term, you see these small progresses and you see these small victories and those small victories, they stack up to the big victory. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, you know, say those one percent all added up. Um, it's interesting. It's 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 it, 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 these are you know I've I've had the pleasure of working with, training with you know talking to you know we talked about ambition the other week and you know we played a lot of rugby and some of these best the, the best you know some of the best athletes in the world and it's all similar sort of things like that desire to get better than you were yesterday, and you know more often than not if you're trying to improve yourself constantly you know the effect of it is you are going to be towards the top you know it's it's one of those things it's one of those honesty calls if you kind of take almost complete ownership of your lifting of your training you know for meat bombs or anything like that you can kind of look back across things like right well have i ticked in a, you know a very almost emotionally detached way can i tick every box can i say i've done everything right have if i haven't you know maybe i didn't sleep eight hours every night I got a few bad nights okay well that's something I can work on I can improve upon uh, I can work on that to get better I mean one of the big things uh, one of the reasons why I get a, you on to, today is because I think from what I've seen you know I've, I've seen you pop up on Instagram a few years I think I've, I've seen you around uh, Ashington a couple of times at the um, juniors but it's more just how it's interesting I want to go more into sort of like RPE training I know you're quite a big fan of that I know you've worked with is it you work with RTS a little bit I think I did yeah I worked with RTS for a year with Jim, Jim RTS who's now yeah. left out uh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, just just some just some background, and you know, so we can go more into it because I think RPE can, if used properly, can be an incredible tool, like absolutely game changing. But I think if used improperly, it can really fuck your training up. So one of the things I mean interesting is what you when you rate some of your sets, you know, you say, oh, this is a seven or an eight. I'm looking, I was like, no way, that's a fucking seven. That's like a five. But this is, you know, I've got a couple of fast lifters as well. It's like bang, 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 and all of a sudden it just disappears. But this yeah. is kind of knowing you and your body like with me i'm a very slow grindy lifter so i'll do a one you know one rep and i'll be like that's an rpa it's like it looks like a 10 it's like no and no, i can do a couple more whereas it's, it's very interesting from lifter to lifter so i want to know i think it would be really beneficial for the audience to basically go into how you approach your training um you know if you don't want to give it all away that's totally fine but you know how you approach your training how you incorporate rpe you know it seems to be that you do stay away from failure you know quite a lot but you're still approaching it with huge amounts of intensity um and then how you sort of build your training and then do you ever you know fully go balls deep take everything off and go for it um so yeah i do i absolutely do i did today <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, what 710 pounds for a double i think you're going to right <laughs> uh, oh yeah exactly um so yeah i've been using rpe i mean i i've been using it for like a good couple of years i mean obviously like i i i've had a few different coaches over the years and kind of learned it from them um but even using rpe like i found that it, it, it wasn't working for me for so long like it took me so long to really get it and to really use it effectively um Partly because I was just being too aggressive with it, I think. Um, I think that brought, like, came onto a lot of it. Like um, the coaches that I was with, I, I felt like I would overshoot really, really regularly. And and the more that I did that and looked back at it and you know thought about it, because I I do try and like really like think about what you know. I, I'll, I'll think about a block as a whole. I'll think about every every day that I've done. Like, could I have done better there? What could I change? Like, what could I do differently next time around? So that every block you're, you're trying to improve not just in terms of like the actual, your actual strength go up, but try and improve your approach. Like if you can approach something in a better way, like that matters, that really matters. Um, but yeah, um, so, you know, RP wasn't really working for me. I couldn't figure it out. So I was like, okay, I need to get 
the best people on this. I need to, like, I'm not a normal lifter. This isn't, like, I do the things that other people do. It doesn't work. Like, what, what's going on here? So I kind of, you know, I, I, I decided, you know, I've got to go to RTS. My, I, at the time, I was training with Luke Richardson and like, these really big names who were coached by Jim at RTS. You know, they were coached by, and like, RTS, they're literally the guys that invented RPE. So you go, well, you know, they know their stuff. Like, like peaking strategies, that's their thing. You know what I mean? Like, if anybody can help me get to a comp and actually display my strength it's these guys um so i jumped in with jim um and off the bat things went horribly to be honest <laughs> like things went not well um because literally their 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 default strategy that they start you on is like right we're just going to give you like singles at eight on literally everything and we'll just see how you go um and i literally died i literally like, especially because like, I couldn't stop myself from overshooting as well on top of that. So literally like, I, you know, I'd maybe get, you know, a week or two that was good in a block and everything else would just tank. And we were just like, this is not working at all. And, and over the period of time, basically what we realized for me is that intensity really is not my friend. Um, and I really, I, d I personally don't handle that well at all. Like if I'm, if I genuinely go to an at eight or an at nine or anything like that, any, anything over an eight, really uh, anything at eight or over, it basically ends my block. So that, you know, it, like, like what, what's required of me mentally to really push that, like being so close to, cause when you're like, single eight double eight this kind of top end strength um it, it's really close to sort of like what you'd actually do on the day it's quite transferable in like okay you know if i'm lifting this that equals that you know and in my head i think it made every set like that that i did a really big deal so i'd take it really really seriously and bring a hell of a lot of intensity to that and that wasn't sustainable and i would just burn out like physically and mentally um so yeah, that, that just didn't work. And we realized that and we just sort of said, right, well, you know, what are you responding best to? And it was kind of the rep work. We realized like, do you know what? Like your estimated maxes are really high with what you can, you're a repper, you know? And it was kind of like, okay, so these other approaches we've tried over these months just aren't working. So let's just try that and just see what happens. And that's what I love about, about RTS and any good coach really is, is, you experiment it's, it is individual because you, you'll try things and see if they work and if they don't work obviously we're not going to do them but if you're trying something and it's not working at all okay we have to do something differently we have to try something else we have to find a way to make this work and that's what me and jimmy did really effectively and you know like he, there was a lot of input from me i felt like i had a real say and he was like you know it, it's, a, it's a weird approach to go okay so you're coming up on euros which is the biggest comp of your life um and we're just gonna do sets of five and it's kind of like and like, you know, maybe by the end of the block, we'll get up to like a five or eight. And you go, well, that's a long way from intense. You know, like, <laughs> is this going to work? But you just kind of have, like, I was pretty on board with it. I was kind of like, you know, we've tried heavy singles. Like, you know, we, we, we've tried doing like a uh, like single at nine or whatever a, a yeah, week which, or two. Which of course RTS then, is famous for, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then doing like openers and then last warm-ups and stuff. And I, 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 I did that for Worlds. It was the worst performance of my life. Genuinely, I, I I dropped a, a deadlift on grip to finish off the day that w that I'd pulled in 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 a competition a year and a half before. I dropped three hundred and I'd pulled it in in the gym uh, in in uh, at juniors in twenty seventeen. So mm. I pulled it ages a year and a half prior, and then just couldn't even do that. And like it, everything just went. I mean, it, it wasn't a terrible day from a numbers standpoint. I squatted two eighty two. I benched one seventy five, so and great. I um and, and I I just missed three hundred. Um, mm. So like, that's not bad, but like they were all comp PBs, I think, but I think with where I believed I could be and like in the buildup, I, I, I'd had squads like 10 weeks prior and I outperformed all of those and just absolutely tanked on the day. Yeah. Just the pressure as well. Yeah, no, I, we, before you came on, uh, Don and I were talking about this, I had my last comp, you know, it was a regional, you know, I won it fair enough, but comp wise, all PBs, but fuck me, it was shit. Like, uh, just, yeah. uh, I put it down to my weight cut in day because um, you touched on it earlier about, we, we also touched on at the start about how I think a lot of the young lifters these days are limiting themselves by weight classes. I think it's a good starting point, but but it's what, you know, you talked about you, Kieran, you know, well, I think Luke's always just been a fucking. What is it with Yorkshire lifters, by the way? You're fucking men. Well, we're just big lads, you know. <laughs> it's ridiculous blood. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway um where are we going um but yeah it's, it's the standards you hold yourself and it was it's almost i would hand my heart say i would rather have lost that comp to a better lifter and lifted more in myself like i would rather have lifted three you know way more and come second to a better lifter on the day because then i can say all right well 
I'm a, I'm, I'm a piece with that, which is a weird thing to say, but I, I truly believe that. But I think from, you know, from, I think me and Don have spent the last 10 minutes nodding our head, because what has been so refreshing to hear, and, you know, you're obviously a very, com you know, very high level lifter, but you're working with coaches and you, for the first thing you said is it was shit, it didn't work at all. But, but you said, but what you've done here is you've almost like built that, you've built a relationship, a bit of trust where you say, look, this isn't working. How can we figure this out? And that's that athlete coach relationship. It's not just the autocratic coach going, do this, do this, do this. It's that combination. Did this work? Does it not feel work? I mean, you know, I feel better benching on a Wednesday. Maybe I should put my heavy day on that day. You know, little things like that. And that, that um, conversation of the team. When you, when you get a coach, you're, you're getting someone to be on your team. You're not getting a dictator to tell you what to do or to tell you the best way of doing things because they don't know. Um, when it's an individual, you, you can't tell someone off the bat, this is the best way to do everything. Yeah. It's impossible, <laughs> you know, uh, like it, it, it definitely is a, a joint effort and you have to work with the person. You, you can't work against them. You know, you can't, yeah. it, it's the it same. With that. Shit, doesn't it? You just don't believe in it. You can't force something to work, but you can't force higher intensity to work for somebody. Cause it's just it might not, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's, I almost see my role as a coach as a problem solver, like trying to, fix certain things what what might work for someone else doesn't work for them it's interesting that the um the single i went to a seminar with mike t like a few years ago i don't, I don't know if, did you guys that one of supreme training like a few years ago i didn't know no i didn't no, well it was great but you know this guy invented rpe and we're basically talking to him and you know the single you know i know what's his name uh, joey flex is big on it as well the singles like i really rate that personally i think it's really good but what i found is if you go that tiny bit over it it fucks you whereas if well, that's what we mean by overshooting by the way is you know if you meant to lift the but basically what we mean is a single where you can just come in get it done uh, you don't have to think about it too much whereas if you just go that a little bit too much your back offsets just go to crap um, so yeah. you know, we spoke over DMs briefly, and I'm constantly experimenting with myself. And you know, not necessarily some of the people I train with. I like to do it myself first and see what it's like. But the difference between doing all right, well, is straight sets the, a good way to go? Right? For some people, it might be. Well, some people might need that ramping up to a top set, or maybe a pyramid style. Or you know, there's there's so many different tools in the box. It's interesting talking to other you know lifters that have you know like you that have, that have been there and done that and worked with some good coaches that. There's so many different things, so many different tools. And, um, you know, what you think, you know, for you, like like almost that sort of five by five hit in a top five kind of works. And it works really fucking well, which is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, when it comes to overshooting, like I say, it's such a bad thing. Um, and it's a bad thing, like not for the reasons that most people think, like, like, eh. Like you've got to think about your week as a whole, you, or your, you know, your block as a whole. You can't necessarily just think about like one session at a time. I do, I do like the mentality of kind of like taking it as it comes and taking that one session at a time and just focusing on doing that session well. Um, but obviously, when you get, especially the high level you get and the stronger you get, like that week as a whole, you've got to see as like you only have so much energy, you only have so much time, you only have like so much work you can do well. You know, um, you, you, you know, like imagine you just were to do twenty sets of five. And it's like, okay, okay, how many of those sets of five are going to be good? And it's mm. like, you know, maybe you get four or five that are, would be properly good. Or, you know, so if you spread that volume out more over, think about that more over, over the course of a week yeah. and you think about, right, well, how, how often can you actually do really well? And it's not as often as you think, you know? And so when it, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the back off's going to shit and it's like, you know, that can stack as well. Like, you know, if you build that fatigue, that can carry over into future sessions. And then all of a sudden that then, you know, you if you try and keep pushing there and you don't just take the L and scale back and let, let, you, let your body actually recover and catch up, then it stacks again. It just keeps stacking up and your performance keeps going down and down and down while the fatigue is just building and masking your strength. Yeah, well, fatigue mass performance. Yeah, we talk a lot about MRV on the show as well. Um, it's it's it's, an, it's a really important thing. I think you kind of you, you got me there. Like yes, yes, yes. Like training is in session to session. Like I just you know you know I'm just to my own horn. I did my first full plate bench. I was very very happy about that. Um, but the two sessions before that, mate, it was fucking terrible. Like I had to really, and this is with the RPE. You almost have to be like, I see yourself as your training self here and your emotional self, and normally they're here together. Because I find sometimes you have to really put this one here and be like, okay, well, this is a part of shit. I have to take what's there. And I mean, I personally really struggle with that. And I get very emotionally tied up into my lifting. How do you find that as a lifter? Because watching you lift, you look like you're pretty locked in. You're, you're pretty oh, switched. I'm one of the most emotional lifters you'll probably ever meet. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, I, 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 worked like, with, I worked with Screamer for a little bit, so you might be second on that one. <laughs> you, see, you see it on my face. You see it in the way that I hype myself up. Like, I'm quite a hype lifter. Um, and I'm very focused and just, like, very driven when I'm training. And, like, you know, like I, if, if anybody, I want it. You know, I really, really want it. Um, but you, you, you have to – you learn to understand over a period of time that it's like – you know, I'm 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 not at my strongest at the start of a block. I'm never going to be at my strongest at the start of a block. I'm. You have to build into things. You have to give it the time to to you know grease that groove to get that technique good to to even just in terms of weight. You know, like for example, deadlifts. Right. We'll use my deadlifts as an example. I finished with 325 for a double. Right. I started the block with 292. It's a big difference. You know, I, the 292 I did for a double. It was like a six. And it's like, well, you know, I could have started. With, with 300 or 302, which would have been like a double at like maybe eight-ish. Um, but it's like that then would have stunted me the next week and I wouldn't have had the kind of progression that I had and I wouldn't have been able to build on that performance. I wouldn't have banked a win and been like, right, up next, you know, next week we'll go that little bit more, we'll that little bit more. And like you just stack up those wins and it's just so much easier to to fuel that progress. And it's, you know, even then it's, it's progressive overload. Like it's nothing super complicated. It's progressive overload with you know, holding your intensity back because in bank, if, isn't it? Yeah. if you jump in at like an at eight plus on week one, you're not giving yourself a whole lot of room to build. Like, the, you know, how much can you add to that before you're overshooting? And it's like, so with, with my young guys that I coach, I'll be like, right, you're going to be strong in like five weeks time. You know, for now, just play the game. Just wait, just, just be patient and build it up, you know, build into it. And, you know, by the time you get to that fifth week, if you've, if you've allowed yourself those undershoots and you've allowed, and then, you know, that isn't doing RP4 or three, you know, this crazy undershoot, but, but just being on the level and hitting weights where it's like, cause RPE, it isn't just, I had this many reps. Powerful just use it like that. Powerful just use it as I had this many, many reps left in the tank, which I think is a good way to use it. But, at the end of the day, it's a scale of difficulty out of 10. It's how it felt to you. And then, you know, you, you get out from under the bar and you're immediately thinking, like, how hard was that? You immediately, and, and then you watch the video and that gives you information, but it doesn't tell you the whole story, you know? It, like, my videos will only ever change my RPE by, like, maybe a half. Sometimes rarely by one RPE it'll change it by, up or down. So you, it really is how it felt. And, like, that's the most important thing because... You know, like for me, for example, you say like everything that I do looks like smoke, uh, but it's like, but it's like, it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> like people are like, oh, my 325, that was easy. And I'm like, yeah, easy. How, how often you, how, have you had it? Well, I, I'm sure you, we all do. Well, you lift it and you're like, I nearly fucking died on that set. And then you check your phone. I was like, oh, I looked away actually that one, didn't it? Yeah. Like, especially I mean, with fatigue. Well, it's always going to make it feel worse than it actually looks. You'll always, on a bad day, you'll always look at something and you'll be like, that felt awful. And you'll look at it and be like, it wasn't that bad, but it, it felt it. And that's what matters is, is, you know, you're not pushing to that super hard point all the time because there's just no need. There's a time and a place to sort of display how strong you are. And you want to spend most of the time trying to improve and trying to progress. Um, I mean, honestly, like, I don't know if you saw the video that Johnny Candido made. Um, like about and it was with data driven strength and it was a super it was an amazing video anybody watch like listen to this i would recommend give that a watch because it just backed up everything i already believed which was that um like what really matters is that things move well it's so it's so undervalued that it's crazy not just from the mental standpoint but literally physiologically like those reps where you're starting to struggle and starting to grind they tax you more fatigue wise and you get less out of them as effective reps. So it's like, it's a no brainer. And like, yeah, you have that top end to, to that the, the is important. And they do mention that, that, you know, that you need that top end because that's super specific to the action of doing a one at max. Um, but you, you know, even then, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. You don't just jump in and absolutely because the intensity and like that top end intensity is what can fatigue you the most of anything. So it's, it's being careful with that. It yeah, sounds yeah. like the RPE scale is pretty similar to uh, like reps and reserves sort of thing, which is obviously more on the bodybuilding exactly. side. But it's, it's the that, same thing. Bodybuilders just wanted to jump in on it, didn't they? Yeah, pretty much. They've just yeah. they've called it their own thing. It's like um, plates per side instead of just saying the actual weight this, on the this bar. This is why I won't lift with twenty fives because then when you say plates per side, it doesn't sound as good. 
That's depressing. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like like there's no weight on it. And it's like this yeah. is really heavy, guys. I promise. Yeah. yeah Look heavy. at the bar bend. That's how you can tell if it's heavy. <laughs> Unless it's an Alico, right? But um, yeah, no, the reps and reserve is it's, it's, it's as you were saying, Don, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, it, it sounds like the exact same thing. Um, and it's interesting what you're saying there about building strength like you see so many like guys go into the gym and they're displaying their strength they go in they get under the bar they do like as you said an rpe 8 or an rpe 9 like every single week and these are also the guys that then injure themselves because they're not taking all the other yep. aspects of it properly whereas you speak to somebody like yourself who's incredibly strong who's going right at the beginning of my block like I had, what, an RPC probably got, what, four or five reps in reserve there or something like that. But you're building that over time so that you're then peaking your strength for when you want to display your strength. And I think it's just, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's powerlifting, whatever it is, it's, it's training for the outcome rather than letting your ego take over and just going, right, I want to put as much on this bar as I can today. I completely agree. Um, like, especially with the, with the comment about ego, like ego is a real problem in, in powerlifting in bodybuilding as well. I think it has, it has its place where it can really mess up your progress and can really affect that guy ripped his pec off oh. his, um, the guy completely detached his pec, didn't he? Because he was doing oh. this the gram. Yeah. Let's get into that. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a bodybuilder. Um, he can't even get like the bar to his chest like literally like in, on any working spec because he's so tight and he, he was like yeah i did i did an incline i did it like lasted like six seven months ago and it's like so why are you going that heavy it's that's not safe like you you need time doing the movement to to you know to to build some safety in there to you know have that time so your body can adjust to what you're doing you can't just yolo like imagine i didn't deadlift for a year i just yolo the max i would get hurt 100 percent of the time you know, and it's the same thing. And it's like, it's so far out of your wheelhouse as well. You know, you're yeah. a bodybuilder. Why are you doing one at max? What, what, like, what's the value in that? Oh, it's for clout it's because it's Larry same. Wheels and I want to show off. Like, yeah. all right, now. Exactly. it's like, you deserve to get hurt, mate. You deserve to get hurt. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, was, uh, it wasn't a nice thing to watch on that. I mean, in terms of, I mean, how have you been? Because, I mean, you, you, you're still, you're still quite, Although I'd say you've you know achieved incredible stuff already, I'd say you're still a very young lifter. I mean, you're only 24, I guess. So, like, what is? I've had my share of injuries for yeah. sure. Have you, um, have, you so, have you coped with them? And have you learned from them? So, so um, I'll, well, start, I'll start. start with deadlift because, like, obviously for me mentally, today was a really, really big day because it was like obviously I haven't. Pr- surpassed that in a year and a half um, and part of the reason I hadn't surpassed that in a year and a half is because I went into lockdown in in March you know and, and it was my final year as a junior and there was a lot of pressure of like you know I need to be pushing still and even though I didn't have the kind of environment that I'm used to I, I didn't have my training partners around and it was a lot harder I still was really pushing myself um, and even though it felt harder in the gym I was trying to keep up with the same kind of weights you know I was trying to still handle heavy weight and push as best I could um, so the you know the environment changed. I didn't really account for that, um, and because of that, and I was just pushing too hard too often. I I literally tweaked my hamstring. Um, well, I say tweaked. Like I mean, I'd, I'd argue to say say it was a tear because literally I, it was it was like I did like a set of eight I think with two sixty five, um, and it was on a deload week when I was supposed to be taking it easy, and I didn't feel that good that day, and I was like, I'm just gonna send it anyway like you know this is uh, it's moving okay i'll just go for it you know i'll do 265 and the rp wasn't that high you know it wasn't anything crazy but it was enough that it, it took me out it just my, my body it, the fatigue was too high and my body couldn't cope um and i literally felt it at the time i literally felt it happen i felt um like something in my hamstring almost like pop like literally and i immediately knew like something is wrong um i just dropped the bar um and i'm just sat there like i've I've, 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 I've injured. Great. Great. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is with hamstrings is they're really, really persistent. It was the first one I'd ever had, the first hamstring I'd ever had. Um, and it, I'm not going to lie. Um, I, I was still trying to deadlift kind of on and off. Like I was still trying to like train around it through it to an extent I was keeping intensity really low. It wasn't hurting. It wasn't painful, but I was very cautious when something happens during a set, 
it's really, really scary. Like, I don't know if you ever had that, guys, but it's like when you properly hurt yourself while lifting something reasonably heavy, you just become terrified of lifting heavy. It's a thing in your head. So I was trying to overcome that and trying to, like, progress back. But I, I was honestly, I still was still trying to push because I was like, it's my last year as a junior. Comps could be on. I need to be ready. I need to find a way to keep doing this. Um, but as a result, it didn't heal. Um, and it's whenever I'd go too heavy, I would re-aggravate it again, again and again and again. I want to say I re-aggravated it, like the same injury three or four times. So it ended up being something I could have gotten over in a month or two. And it ended up being sort of a four-month ordeal, more or less. Um, and it was only really when, my, like I said, my friend Eric Marta, he took over my programming. He's one of the few people that I trusted with my programming to take over. Because at the time, I, I, I'd just been working with Jimmy, but stopped during lockdown because I was like, you know, it's as hard enough as it is. I'm, I'm just going to take some time to sort of do my own thing, which again, wasn't like the smartest of moves. Um, but yeah, I jumped in with Eric and Eric really made me scale back. Um, and he's a lot more sort of on the recovery side of things with like, you know, making making me do my walks, making me like stretch, making me like sort of be more, a bit more mobile, be on my P's and Q's with everything else. Um, and that along with just really taking, entity and volume way down and really starting over and rebuilding i was able to finally get past it got back in a gym and then did the same thing to my other hamstring which was obviously just amazing <laughs> no uh, the, the good thing is i it, it, was, it, was the, it was the same thing on the other side it was just lateral hamstring literally just like went on, on it was i didn't even feel it during it was after so it wasn't as severe but after i was like that has hurt my other hamstring that doesn't feel good um I left it like for a solid week and was like, I can't pull. So, you know, we knew what to do this time. It was way faster. It wasn't anywhere near as big of a deal. But yeah, the point is I've kind of spent the last year, not quite a year, but I'd say a good six months unable to lift above about 260 on deadlift um, for so, so long, which has really stunted my progress in deadlift and has really meant that, and especially with the heavy weight, like I've been terrified of it. Yeah. Um, so honestly, to come back, you know, and after all this time and pull, you know, what is basically a 12 kg PB for two reps, um, finally passed it. And that makes it worth so much more is like, you know, I have overcome all this shit to get all the way back to be at my, to be beyond my best, which was uh, one, it made it, like I say, you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Like, like to have done that to me was worth so much. It was just amazing. Um, not the only injury I've had. I've had a few, obviously, like I've, Little niggles, though, nothing super serious. I mean, I, I, I've had the same thing with something something happening during only once ever other than that, which was my deadlift. It was um, my form has always been very roundy. I've always been very back. It gets backy when it's heavy. There's not a lot I can do about it. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, like I've always rounded over a lot, mainly in my thoracic, so it's fine. Um, and the one time I ever like lost my lower back, just immediately just when it is true what they say you know like there's so much less movement through like your lumbar spine that you really can't afford to round your lower back otherwise you're just going to yeah. get like yeah. destroyed yeah. And, like that went during yeah. and I, that was about two weeks and, and i was fine i literally just didn't squat or deadlift for two weeks and i was i was good that's the point yeah you, you you would have got lucky if you've only done it once you know you can recover very well from it it's when it becomes a biscuit back like mine where it trims yeah. on a fucking knife edge that it's a pain but um yeah basically you know you, you see plenty of guys with um what do you call it rounded thoracics yeah i actually you know I had, like an in thing i did it before it was cool i did it because i couldn't hold <laughs> it in a good position yeah you see some like, people purposely I, doing it it just looks <laughs> like this but uh, i've had some people where uh, trying to get them to be a flat back deadlifter made it worse. It's not a good thing for them. It's just as long as you know, general thumb is as long as you're in neutral, you know, tight brace, bit of thoracic, you should be okay. When you yeah. go, from, like you said, that position of change in the lower back, that's when you're fucked. Yeah, I, I think the rule of thumb obviously is you know you have to keep your lower back locked it locked in. You know you have to keep that brace. You have to keep everything solid. Um, and then, you know, as long as it doesn't compromise your lockout, I don't think it's an issue. Like for me, my lockout is literally the strongest part of my deadlift. It's the easiest part. Uh, for whatever reason, just maybe just how I'm built or whatever, but it, it, off the floor is where it's hard. Once it's off the floor, I can pull anything. Like, so it's literally like... We've all got bits, you know, haven't we? How, when you, is it really? Like really, when I'm rounded in my thoracic, my arms are longer. So how is that an issue, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I tell you, everyone... Um... <sighs> It's weird with palette, and everyone's got their sticking point, right? Yeah, I mean, normally guys that uh, you probably find this with your guys uh, who have shit lockouts is because they haven't set up properly from the bottom for getting the rest of the lift sorted. So it's kind of like it's all I always find that tough. 
I mean, I mean, how do you approach this in terms of variation? Do you, are you more along the lines of if you just keep doing the comp lift well, frequently you'll get better or are you more, okay, well, let's say, I don't know, you crap off the floor, let's do a pause off the floor deadlift. Like, I mean, what's your kind of approach? Um, so for me personally, or for me as a coach, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, personally as a coach. I mean, I guess it's tools out of the toolbox. But I mean, is there a time and a place, you know, I guess the general rule. Well, I'll hear your thoughts, yeah. I, mean, I, I love variations, like for sure. Like I absolutely love variations. And I think um, with, with the way powerlifting is specifically at the moment, it's way too like, oh, I've got to do my SBD or like, oh, I've got to do this or that. When there's something to be said for, if I have more muscle, I'm going to lift more weight in the long term and getting bigger and stronger and putting on it's weight. Really I love it, I love it. It. it is so true though do you know what i mean like like these amateur lifters not i'm not, not amateur it's the wrong word like these newer lifters and novice lifters that don't really have a whole lot of experience are just doing the comp lifts and it's like nah man like you you like you're like a stick like you gotta build a base first you gotta build... <laughs> you're, just, you're just kind of describing <laughs> what I put in every, a hypertrophy <laughs> every ipf yeah, like, lift they're going like but then you give them like leg press and they'd be like wow uh, uh, I don't know. Fucking, uh, what's his name? Bryce Lewis doesn't do that or something like that. He's just like, oh, fucking hell, man. Yeah, just, like, <laughs> don't worry about what they do. Right, there them, mate. Like, there's something to be said for you just training really fucking hard for a couple of years. Yeah. And then in a couple of years from that, you'll have that base that you'll really be somewhere. But it's like, you know, ha like how strong are you going to get with minimal muscle mass? You know, if you're training hyper specifically for strength, like, yeah, you're going to max out what you have, like in terms of like your muscle is going to become a, you know, you're going to get those motor neurons and whatever that everything's going to be like as optimal as it can be, but still you'd be better off spending the time to, like grow and to fill out and like you know this comes back to sort of what you were saying about people holding themselves back to a weight class like uh, th that was the biggest mistake that I I've ever made in powerlifting I, I genuinely believe that like I like I say I was a 93 um and I didn't want to go at 105 because I was like oh the, those 105s are really strong Kieran's up there I, don't, I can't compete with him so I've got to stay down where it's like safe and where I can be competitive when actually um when you gain weight like what like let's say the difference between a weight class is 40 kilos right hypothetically random example you know like top end like the best performers are, there's a 40 kg difference in terms of like first to first you know and then there's people in between that um if you go up a weight class do so you gain that eight to ten kilos or whatever and you gain that well that's worth way more than 40 kg on your total it's worth so much more like like and, and not only that it's like the whole reason we all start this is because we want to look good and we want to be big and we want to you know like have the physique that we want with this strength, like it's a byproduct. It isn't the only goal, but it's a nice thing to have. And there's no, no, no one would ever say no to having bigger arms and, you know, like bigger legs and whatever. Like, why would you say no? You can't, like, no way. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we all got into this for that sort of like, like that reason of yeah. we want to, you know, get better. Why would you hold yourself back from doing that? It just doesn't make sense. And especially oh. when, you know, all right, you know, fair enough. If you're like literally going to Worlds, you know, if you're literally an international or if you're like literally like top two nation nationally, like I can kind of understand that. But any other reason, it's just sort of like records don't really matter. Like records in five years will be 100 kg heavier than they are now because the amount of people in this sport is going to like double again. Oh, absolutely. Like, look at fucking, we probably still haven't seen the, you know, there's, we talk about this, like we, we probably still haven't seen the best lifts in the world in powerlifting. Cause if you think about, let's talk about Ray Williams, you know, with his squat, it's, it's unbelievable. But if you think about why he's got that squat, Ray Williams has got that squat was because he was told he wasn't big enough for the NFL. So let's yeah. have a think about that. He was told he wasn't the right size and shape for the NFL, but this guy squats, well, like four, 450 kilos plus. It's like, Hang on, and he's not the biggest guy there. You're like, fucking mm -hmm. hell! Like, that's really getting your mind blown. Yeah, there's there's going to be somebody out there that's the absolute genetic elite when it comes to think about like Ronnie Coleman in bodybuilding. Like, if they did yeah. a genetic test on him and he has every genetic trait for building muscle and every genetic trait for dropping body fat, like he is literally yeah. perfect. Like, we're not going to see another one of those. It's very unlikely you've seen. The genetically like gifted person that's got into the sport has been in it long enough to then be kind of like at that top tier i think over the next 50 100 years we are going to see some absolute freaks of nature coming through because the the ability of us to be able to get them into the right places is a lot better yeah i mean even now like 
training age. Training age is huge. I started powerlifting specifically when I was like around 18, like maybe like 17. I think 17, I did like my first proper one at max squat, you know? Um, and it's like, so I've been training for strength for a little bit before then, but you know, nothing me like mega serious. And it's like, there's guys now that are starting at 12 or 13. And there's these 14 year olds pulling 600 pounds. And you go, Crazy. good God, what will you become one day? <laughs> it's it's mind-boggling. Like, I've, it, it's actually insane. Like, it, it, it's mind-boggling. Like, I really struggled with this when I was younger. It used to get me really down and emotionally, well, I wouldn't say traumatized, but really got in my head that there is someone better than me or someone stronger than me. Because in rugby, you know, it's all like you go to these trials, that person's better, you know, this person's like, all right, you're going to do this. You're and it, it's really fucking hard. But then I think when I got to a certain age, it's almost like it almost made me happy that there's people stronger than me because it makes me think, well, it's been done. Like, you know, uh, if someone's dead, I, you know, you talk to me, a kid, like you're going to deadlift, you know, potentially 700 pounds. We're like, fuck off, that's impossible. And you're like, look at this person, look at this person, look at this person. And you're like, all right, well, it's almost comforting. I don't know if that's the right word to see that there are people better than you. So you can push through to those numbers. And I think like, you touched on it earlier, but I think that's where a lot of people talk themselves out of comp. They just won't do them. They just, they, they, they just stay away. I mean, I, I always hear people ask me, oh, I can deadlift this. I mean, is, is that a good standard? Like, will that be all right? And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter. Like, well, yeah. how is that to you? Like, it's, it's, it's such a big thing because why would it be, even if it is really good, it's your first lift. Like, you've got, so don't look at that. Look so much more beyond that, right? Particularly men don't want to compete unless they're basically the best already. Like, yeah. I, I, I I have trouble with a few people being like, be, a few, awful you, know, you should just jump in and compete because no matter how well you do or how well you gauge it and how you know efficient you are and whatever, your first meet, you'll always make a lot of mistakes and you'll always underperform and you always, you won't get it perfect the first time because there's so much to learn. And even me as your coach, there's so much that I can help you with, but at the same time, there's a there's a learning process that is specific to that lifter. Like competing in itself is a skill, and like that's absolutely the case with a lot of sports that you do. Bodybuilding as well is the same thing. You know that like like the, the amount that you can fine tune that approach to getting you like you in the peak condition you can be in like is huge, absolutely huge. And you're never going to get it right the first time. So get started and practice. I like, say so anyone listening, that's what I recommend. Just get out there and do it. Because it's, if it's what you want to do, there's not there's nothing that should stop you. It doesn't matter where you place. Place last, but get some PBs if you can, and you know have a good day and learn what the sport's all about. And you know, like people will get behind you if you care. People will get behind you, so you're not going to be an embarrassment. People will want you to succeed, and that's what the sport is. It, it's interesting. All... It's always the... Sorry, carry, carry on, Daniel. I, was say, I think that's all like weightlifting style sports, whether it's bodybuilding, strongman. Yeah. Um, powerlifting like you no matter how you do no matter how you place like I remember going to a, a bodybuilding not a bodybuilding uh, powerlifting meet and just the atmosphere was that of it didn't matter if you were the 60 kilo guy like benching whatever he was or the guy that's over 120 kilos and going for a ridiculous amount like the crowd got behind you everyone was patting each other on the back everyone was just there to enjoy the day to lift some weights, to have some food and just to have fun. Like yeah. it didn't matter who, obviously it's nice to get a trophy at the end, but it, everyone was there just to enjoy themselves. The same thing when I went to a bodybuilding show, like backstage, like everyone was talking. If it was your first show and you were nervous, like one of the other guys would like talk you down and go, oh mate, like you need to this, you need to that. It's very, very like friendly, like within these sports because, because it's so individual and, just to be there on competition day, everybody who's there as a competitor knows the level of sacrifice and things you've had to put in just to be able to show up on that day. So I think a lot of people are in almost, if they've never been involved in it, they could be intimidated by it, but it's knowing that everybody that's there has been through the same process and will recognize that process that you're going through as well. Exactly, man. Like for me personally, my first comp, I went five for nine. I got five out of my nine lifts, which is very bad. Like, if you do that, you've not had a good day and you're not satisfied. But, you <laughs> know, every, every competitor that, <laughs> that, that competes has had a first one and has had one where it didn't go as well as you want to, to go. So you're there to support everyone else and try and help them do the best they can and to have a laugh while you're at it. That's the goal. And if you do that, everyone comes away satisfied, you know?
Absolutely. Um, it did, yeah, just you hear the same story all the time. Like Eddie Hall's first camp, I think he didn't have, he did, he'd never touched a strongman bit of equipment before. And, you know, he's done all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the time, like, you know, powerlifting, <laughs> turning up for, for meets in freaking like Nike Air Maxes and things like that. It's just, you know, and still squatting crazy mouths. But you, it, yeah, you, you, you certainly learn. Yeah, it's a baptism of fire. Uh, absolutely. But, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, it's been really, really great talking to you, um, um, Ben. Um, yeah, I mean, we've only ever chatted over DMs briefly, but uh, no, it was, it was good to sort of get to know your story a bit. A bit kind of, kind of worms googling it open. <laughs> I yeah, just love no, to well, we love it. Like, I mean, me off. Give me a yeah. topic and I'll just go. <laughs> well, I kind of feel like, you know, powerlifters, you'll geek about which fucking plate is better than another plate and stuff like that. But uh, I think what, you know, there's some valuable lessons there to take away in terms of high performance how to approach your training specifically if you want to get strong but then you know it's nice to tie in you know Don, Don's a bodybuilding coach that kind of tying in the bodybuilding getting strong and you know there's a lot of parallels between the sports and yeah. yes you've got your typical fat pal to sit around and blah 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 cool but you, you know we, we mentioned um what's his name Ross uh, Russ Swell I forgot his um, I only know his Instagram name um, um uh, Love Russ you say you know obviously a, a complete freak but at the same time that you know these guys redefining what a power they kind of can do and kind of yeah. um so yeah. i think the age of the fat powerlifter is slowly dying out as well like it's so. slowly like nah like that's not that's not optimal like that you know like being athletic and like eating properly and like having these things having everything right you know like like being an athlete is what is becoming the like the popular thing and the the more common thing like it isn't just like get fat for a sport no one cares about like it, it you know like like someone like russ like yeah, physique is a, he, like, he's done bodybuilding comps as well and like his physique is really really good and it's like like and like he's insanely lean like i mean he sits at like i, I mean nearly 90 kilos i think and competes at 83 and at 90 kilos he has abs and it's yeah. like and he competes at 83 and he has to get he has to almost lose some muscle mass to get into that class Oh, but it's yeah. like that's, that's what that's becoming you know and like filling out a class truly um you have to be really really lean uh, it's a long process for sure absolutely man so where can um where can people find you mate what's your you know where do you hang out i mean i'm i'm literally just on instagram like like that, that that's it <laughs> yeah cool what's 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 your what's what's your tag on instagram uh at benji underscore wharton w-h-a-r-t-o-n Awesome, man. Well, uh, give him a follow to see some redonkulous lifts with some, some, some okay lifts. <laughs> We're oh, working okay. on them. Uh, they're great. It's, it's, it's they're good. Always work. working, man. A work in progress. Always trying to get better, hey? And then um, you can find me at Bubbles and Beans on Instagram, Dan Frazier on Facebook. And Don, where can we find you? So I'm at Deej PT on both Instagram and Facebook. So yeah, it's been great to have a chat to you today, Ben. I, I've definitely learned uh, quite a bit and I will make sure that I check out some of those. So to a bodybuilder, those lifts are insane, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's been great to catch up with you, mate. And good luck um, with uh, the next, good luck with your, um, your home comp sort of thing really really enjoyed this good fun no it was great and uh we'll keep in touch for the next time peace bye bye